Well, security continues to be on the front burner. It's almost at the front and center of everything. Everything you look at these days, when you even talk about International Press Freedom Day, uh, you know, the greeting also centered around security and how we need to be careful at this time. Uh, but, well, I guess we have people in our studio this morning who have been more than careful, but have also said things as they truly are and are also feeling the pinch in their different constituencies as the problem of insecurity continues to bite. Uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. We have with us Senator Olubumi Adetumbi, who is the Chairman, Committee on National Planning and Economic Affairs, is a member of the APC. You're welcome to Sunrise Daily this morning. Thank you very much. We also have Honorable Yakubu Barde, who is the former minority whip, a member of the PDP. Honorable, you're welcome to summarize the leaf this morning. My pleasure. Thank you. Well, the National Assembly has not been quiet um, on this issue of security. Over and over again, it would seem that you've had cause uh, to weigh in on the matter. And oftentimes, uh, the verdict is very worrisome. Um, even for you, M on more than one occasion, you have been documented, um, you know, to have said things like, let us go to the villa and bring the problems to the president. You know, perhaps he doesn't understand the magnitude of what it is that we're... And this, this uh, let me say, well, the one, the video which I particularly remember was at least two years ago. Uh, in the 8th Assembly, the Senate was worried enough to organize a conference uh, which, to which they invited the executive to rob minds on the matter. Yes, yet we're in the Ninth Assembly now, and we're still talking about the same problems of insecurity. I think it was just last week or two uh, weeks ago when a colleague of yours was said to have cried uh, on the floor of the National Assembly. Are we really making progress with finding solutions to the problems bedeviling us? Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, this is a very, very serious problem that the country is facing, the issue of security. And I think the problem is very self-evident. Clearly, the country has lost the monopoly of legitimate use of violence. And it has lost this to non-state actors who are taking over spaces in various uh, you know, sectors of the country. What started in my degree as uh, a small cell of disgruntled, unhappy young people have mutated into a national, uh, sub-regional problem that has become hydra-headed, multi-dimensional monster. Uh, especially in Nigeria, where a local problem in the Northeast is now nationwide. And there's no part of this country, and no state in this country has not been part of this unfortunate incident. Um, and this is why, in my own view, uh, Nigeria needs to regain its confidence and the necessity for consultation and bringing people on board. This is no longer a partisan issue. It's beyond parties. It's a national concern. And every concerned Nigeria must be given an opportunity to participate in the process of finding solutions. Because oftentimes, uh, we often say that government should do this, government should do this. But democracy is government of the people, by the people and for the people. So government, democracy, is a partnership between government and the people. When government has issues, it runs to the people. And my advocate, I mean advocacy simply is we need more heads around the table. Uh, the, the presidency should engage more with other stakeholders in this enterprise called Nigeria. We have former presidents. Many of them have been quiet. A few of them have been outspoken. We have traditional rulers. We have faith-based leaders of this, uh, of this country. We have private sector that is severely affected. Production has nose dived. The economy has taken a hit. Other West African countries are beginning to take business from Nigeria. Why? Because Nigeria does no longer provide the enabling environment for big businesses to thrive. Small businesses have run out of uh, breath. Farmers have abandoned the field. As a matter of fact, if care is not taken, we are approaching a situation of severe food shortage because 
the little production we've been able to do over the years, which have been issue and benefit of hindsight is insufficient. It's been taken away from us. So we have a big problem. I believe that this government, our government, and I'm a member of the party, a supporter of the government, a sympathizer to this government. But beyond all of this emotional, sentimental attachment to our party, to our government, there is a bigger, bigger responsibility of rescuing Nigeria from what appears to be uh, endemic problems within the country itself. Heavy human security challenges, poverty, lack of jobs, youth unemployment, the, absent, the, the absence of hope for the younger generation. They cannot navigate their future with any degree of certainty that this is what is going to happen to me in one year, in two years, in five years. So when people are in that state of despair, you expect worse behavior. So we need to come together at this point in time. And I believe the president has a responsibility to provide the leadership for consultation, for setting the signals of hope and a better future for all Nigerians. Indeed, you have you know, <coughs> made reference to you know, having more heads around the table. Uh, the question is, where is the table located? And who is doing the invitation to this table to find solutions? Does such a table exist, is the question. This country has a leader. And the leader is in the person of the president. And we are saying to him, OK? Because the, the, the challenge of uh, national leadership sometimes can be overwhelming, that you find yourself uh, needing to be reminded of certain things, not because you don't want to do, but because you're simply overwhelmed. And the, the advocacy now is that the president should rise to the occasion. It is not a thing of shame for a leader to call for help. As a matter of fact, it's testimony, it's astuteness, it's a sign of advanced form of patriotism that says, what I, don't, I cannot do, I will seek help to be able to do it. What's the job of a leader? It's to coordinate resources, capacity, bring them on board. The traffic to the villa should be faster, quicker. The doors should be more open. You should be seeing layers of people coming in and out to offer solutions to help the nation. That is what we want our president to do, and that is what I advocate. Mm. Well, you have been at this advocacy for a while. The question is, you know, has it yielded fruit? I believe, I believe there is no danger in repetition, okay? Until the message is received, appreciated. For example, the chief of staff to the president of the Federal Republic is an international scholar in international diplomacy. The Savannah platform that he ran before he became a chief of staff had a program on international uh, terrorism and security. He's a good advisor to the president. And we believe that he should use that proximity to Mr. President to campaign for the necessity for these steps to be taken. It's never too late. It's not too late to start, mind you, Mopwe. It's not too late to start. The important thing is starting and starting now. How many times do we in the National Assembly have to rise for one minute of silence in memory of the dead, people who don't want to die? They don't need our memories of them. They want to live. All they ask for is security, protection, ability to go out and do their work. And that is what our government exists for. And I believe this problem is surmountable. It can be solved, but there is need for more heads to join with the government to solve this problem. Mm. You know, Honorable Yakubu Barde, let me come to you. When Honorable um, Biden, Senator Adetunbi talked about young people and despondency and not being able to plan their future, you know such young people. I mean, your constituency recently uh, suffered some loss. And I think that loss was also the loss of the entire country because, I mean, the fact that they come from Kaduna, went to school in Kaduna, uh, they could have been solving problems for the entire country. And so it is our communal loss as a people. Uh, but nonetheless, you feel it because 
you feel it even more, let me put it that way, because uh, if some of the students are still missing, uh, and so the problem <laughs> sits right uh, at your doorstep in your constituency. I don't know what your thoughts are with regards to uh, finding solutions. The House of Representatives, which you're a member of, has asked the president to declare a state of emergency um, in security. But beyond that, is there anything more that you think that members can do or, I don't know, perhaps even government can do? Yeah, thank you, Maupe. And uh, let me see. It's a real privilege to reach out to many Nigerians on this platform. And I want to first send my condolences to the families of many people that have lost their lives, especially the people in my constituency and the military circle in general. Now, um, it's very unfortunate what has been happening. As a distinguished senator said, it has made the youth unable to know what even tomorrow holds for them. And you see, that is a situation of hopelessness. Yes, the government, I'm part of the government. In any forum, I used to admit that we have failed Nigerians. I inclusive. It's not about partisanship. But the issue is, People will say, when you are a member of the House of Senate, of the Senate or House of Rep, what did you do? That's the question our youth will ask us. Now, like you said, we've said the Mr. President should declare a state of emergency in the security, uh, in, in terms of the security of the country. But sometimes I, I, I look at words not matched by actions. And whatever code name you want to give it, to me, does not matter. But what we want to see is resort. Resort. The question I keep on asking is, when we came to be in this very government today, our promise to Nigerians was that we make life better for them. In terms of security, they will be able to go about their businesses, they will be able to, to, to go to their farms, they should be able to go to schools. They should be able to pursue their daily legitimate needs. But I am heart bleeding today because that is, not, that is not what my people are getting. In the entire constituency where I represent Chikun and Kajuru, of, as you rightly said, people are not able to go to school again. A lot of people are afraid. Most private schools, because they cannot provide security for themselves, have to close down. Now, you see, that deepens the hopelessness of the youth. Because if somebody cannot go to school, what future holds, what does the future hold for him in this country? If you are not able to go to school, acquire knowledge, so that it will enhance your ability to live in this modern society. Now, when you said, what will the House of Reps do? I go back to the issue that, of recent, we asked a committee of the House to find out what the monies we appropriated to the military was done with. And to the shame of Nigerians, the chief of army staff came and told them that they should call those people who were there as if governance is not continuing. He is holding the office. The House of Red members were not asking him as a person, but we were asking the chief of army staff of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. It's an office. And you saw the drama that took place. Is it not a shame that this is the somebody, chief of army staff, who will betroth the military into his hands? And he's telling you that he has no record that the House of Red member should call those that were there, that he wasn't there. Was the office not existing? The office is not the person. The people go and people come. But there must be record in the office. Now, for me, that was a setback because we were trying to find out, was this money really used? If it was used, why are results not being achieved? I think that's a step forward. You don't just go, okay, after that encounter, the same chief of army staff went to the Senate committee and he was asking for money. When you were asked by members, give us a record of the procurement of military hardware, and you told them that they should call the people that were there. For me, <clears throat> that's a sign of failure. And it's very disheartening that we have such a person as the chief of army staff. 
It doesn't make sense. That as it may. That is the House of the, uh, of the uh, as Parliamentarian. We do what we call um, oversight function. And part of it is to make sure that these things that the money was appropriate for are used for it. Mm. Now, the next question is this. I'm not a military expert. But the next question is, even if we find out what these monies were used for, I think it, the time has come in this country where we take the fight to the bandits, not being reactionary. Because what is happening today is, most of the times, it's reactionary. When the government, when the, the military tells you that, oh, they'll be patrolling, at the end of the day, okay, i just give an example. In that road between Kaduna and Abuja, there is this uh, female military van, three of them, they used to patrol that area. The question I want to ask, when that kidnap was taking place in Greenfield University, was there no communication channel to tell these people, because they live in Goningora, in Kakao Axis there, and for you to drive from that Goningora to, uh, to, to Greenfield University with a very good vehicle, it will take you less than 10 minutes. So what happens? Is there no communication between the security that were in Greenfield University with the army formation who were on the road? You see, a lot of things have been happening, and I keep on asking, are we really serious and sincere in fighting this fight? Okay, tell me today, before when I was growing up, every police van has a dedicated channel where they communicate with the DPOs. If something is happening here, the next station will be communicated, I mean, they will deploy men and make sure that the vehicles are running in good order. Tell me today. I'm telling you, I had to stop one day. I asked a military checkpoint. I asked them, I said, if something is happening like five kilometers away, how do you get to know? They said, no, the people will run and come and tell them. I mean, does it make sense? Oh, how about you? The people are not able to run to come and tell you. No means of you going to help your security uh, uh, colleagues when there, is, when there is an attack. So even things as, as basic as radio <laughs> equipment you know, is absent. It's absent. Have we been able to investigate fully and thoroughly when these incidences occur? Because, I mean, Greenfield University is the latest in the line, not long list of schools that have experienced kidnapping. Have we been able to investigate thoroughly, uh, you know, incidences of kidnap and how it is? I mean, there's, there's, there are situations whereby the schools are far away from uh, security agencies or, or where, the, where security agencies are resident. Uh, but where they are, say, in the city or where they are situated really, really close to uh, security agents, uh, residents of our board, like we also had in Africa, for instance, have we been able to investigate to really find out what the problem is with a view to, say, correcting or protecting uh, the other educational institutions that are still in operation? Yes, let me put it this way. For me, I, I, I keep on telling people that until... We reorient ourselves to love this country. There are lots of sabotage, sabotage everywhere. There are moles everywhere. And to be honest, I think the bandits have infiltrated the people and even the government. Why is it that an attack is taking place, somebody wants to be kidnapped, and the bandit will tell the person that has been kidnapped that you sold your house yesterday. We are aware, we were told. So it means that they have moles within the society. They have moles, I will be honest with you, I feel even within the military. I give an instance, I don't know how true it is, but I'm reliably informed it was true. When the military were to attack, I mean, um, some years back, I think this, there was this rumors going on that they want to use gas, in making sure that they demobilize the bandit. I think two days later, we, we saw on TV the bandits were with uh, no, uh, face gas masks. Mask. Face masks. Gas, gas masks. Mask. Who told them? <clears throat> Who told them? They are sabotaged to us within. And I'm sorry. I look at this country and said, oh, who will love my country, Nigeria? With every sincerity. Whose allegiance to Nigeria is 100%? The unfortunate thing is that allegiance of most Nigerians is to their religion, is to their ethnic group, or to themselves and the allegiance to Nigeria or to the constitution of Nigeria, maybe it's just 10% of people over the entire country. I tell you this with all sense of sincerity. Um, I, uh, when you ask that, how do we protect the other school students, do you know that 
in a village I don't, I don't like to mention him because it may be a skill to reach to me as well because even as i speak here today i've had situation where i was asked by my village people that please i should know what to say because in the moment i said it the bandit will get the information and they will be attacked i'm no longer safe i can't speak my mind the way i want because my people will be killed. I have relations in the villages. Most of these villages have run away. And they know me if I speak. There are same people within the community who take the message back to the bandit and say, this is the man that said, army should be brought to come and kill you. Oh, but tell me, am I not in a dilemma? Am I not supposed to speak out? Am I not to, supposed to say, look, we need so, 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 and so. The military need to be on their toes. Hmm. Look at it this way today. Honorable, uh, I, I, I have to interrupt you because I'm sure that even my colleagues uh, will have questions for you and we'll be going to them shortly. I think we have three minutes just before the break. Um, let me come back to you again, Senator. It's a really befuddling situation. I mean, when you think about it, it's mind boggling. The fact that when he talks about the fact that, you know, it was in that every layer, I mean, you talked about how the state has lost monopoly of violence, of legitimate use of violence. But it would seem that they've also lost loyalty, uh, you know, from citizens. Uh, when you now start talking about areas being permeated by moles and people not knowing even who to trust. We had a former general, uh, somebody who served in, in a very prominent position in this country, telling us that the military is not neutral. Uh, you, you know, and this kinds of statement, we're not supposed to take lightly, are we? The, the, the truth of the matter is that the, the challenge the country is facing, I think is bigger than the dimension of the narrative. Uh, we are facing a largely regional problem that stretches from uh, the whole Sahel from Atlantic to Nile, the Sahelian region of, uh, of West Africa. This phenomenon is a West African problem. So it, and it's it, flowing in from where it started from all the way Afghanistan to Pakistan to the Middle East. It's not a turn of West Africa. It is indeed. It, okay. uh, however, if we were united as yeah. a people, yeah. if we were sincere, because right now he's made reference to accountability mm -hmm. within the military. We're not able to get that. Mm -hmm. I think we have uh, our current governor of uh, River State you know, speaking on one of our programs saying that you know a billion dollars was appropriated for f from the uh, excess credit. I don't even think that money was appropriated. It was much later it was appropriated. It was just taken from the excess credit account mm -hmm. uh, to provide for security and as we speak we're not able to get any accountability for that money or does the senate you now see, have <coughs> accountability for uh, the money Mope, let me tell you this what the, the 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 procurement process for military hardware takes longer than the immediate need of this country the one billion dollar you talked about was to import jets fighter jets to deal with this insurrection up till now those jets have not arrived because the process of purchase is very political with a lot of international diplomacy. But when countries are in this type of quagmire, you engage what you call government-to-government -government negotiations on the basis of bilateral diplomacy. Nigeria can approach other governments that have capacity to support it by lending a hand while the international procedure for procurement of, of crafts, aircraft, and heavy military hardware is allowed to take place. But it, These are the kind of things that heads around the table provide, because nobody is a repository of knowledge. There is need for more consultation. Nigeria, unless we all unanimously agree that we don't want Nigeria, but for as long as we claim to be Nigerians, one to lead Nigeria, aspire to lead Nigerians, the debate should no longer be about who rules next time as much as what does a person have to offer? What is the solution to the problem that is bef you know, besetting us at this point in time? Let me tell you something. This country is very poor. We have this erroneous belief that Nigeria is a rich country. No, not at all. What do I mean? 
200 million people, mm -hmm. 13 trillion budget, at whatever exchange rate, maybe 25 billion US dollars. Compared to Brazil, with the same population, 10 times public spending than Nigeria. Well, so, so some people will say that's because we have refused to, we are just dwelling with what our current circumstances and we have refused to, you know, leverage on our potential because... That is the point I'm making. See, the Nigerian project needs a rework. Okay. And the rework of Nigerian project has to be the collective responsibility of everybody, regardless of political party. Let's take a break at this point. We'll come back shortly to com continue this conversation. Please stay with us. Well, religious bodies and institutions are not immune any longer from this talk of security. Everyone is putting heads together to find a solution uh, to the problem. We still have with us in the studio Senator Olubu Miyaditumbi and also Honorable Yakubu Barde. We'll now throw this to Lagos uh, for questions from my colleagues. Gentlemen. Well, yes, indeed, uh, Senator. As a matter of fact, we'd we'll like you to just uh, listen to this particular tape. Uh, that was when General Danjuma spoke about it in 2018, which is what uh, Marco didn't make reference to. But here is part of what he said at the time. Every one of us must rise up. The armed forces are not neutral. They collude. They collude. They collude with the armed bandits. They kill people, kill Nigerians. They facilitate their movements. They cover them. If you are depending on the armed forces to stop the killings, you will all die one by one. How do you begin to address that kind of comment coming from that sort of personality in this country, Senator? Well, you see, the human condition likes comfort and assurances. And when those things are missing, uh, extreme passion begin to, to play out. And that's what you see in uh, General T.Y. Danjuma. And you don't take that kind of uh, anxiety or concern lightly because he is a product of the military and by every standard an informed Nigerian so he has he must have a sound basis for saying what he said uh, even though provocative and tending to promote further anarchy uh, we still have to rely on rebuilding the capacity of state to respond to the needs of the people when it comes to security of life and property. There is no alternative. Not everybody can defend themselves. Not everybody can own a gun. Not everybody can afford to buy a gun. What happens to those people? We need to rebuild our nation. We need to rebuild our military. The question of complicity between state actors and non-state actors in the uh, issue of violence is real. We can't deny that. We, we once had a situation when some foreign governments that tended to support us at the early stages of this, uh, of this, of this problem had to you know, exit because um, a lot of their plans were leaked from inside sources. So, for example, where do the bandits get their arms and ammunition from? We need to study the, 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 the supply chain of these people and find out, this is why we're a government, okay? Government is expected to have a higher capacity. There are institutional decay, there are problems of capacity of human resources, even within government. We all know that. But nonetheless, the government, stakeholders, and members of the public, the media, must rise to the challenge and help us to navigate the way forward. This is my immediate reaction. Uh, we cannot... We cannot give up on government. We you cannot give up on but, government, but we have yeah. to rise up to support government to, 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 to do what is needful at a time like this. You know, that there's been several uh, commentary about how did we get here, I think part of what you also referenced just now. But there are those who accuse some members of your party 
before the general elections that brought in the government, saying that some of them were actually responsible for bringing in some of these persons because they thought they were not going to win elections. And they thought that up to now, nobody has really addressed that matter. Have you heard that sort of accusation and what do you think of it? Well, I've heard all of that. I also read it in the newspapers, but that comes largely from a suboptimal understanding of the dimensions of the problem that we are faced with. I just said uh, on this program not long ago that um, the problem Nigeria is facing is a sub-regional problem. You go to Mali, you go to Burkina Faso, Niger, Chad, and all these uh, Sahelian countries, there's a meltdown, including the northern parts of Ghana, Cameroons. All this is happening outside the immediate borders of Nigeria. And you have the frontier states to these international borders where terror is coming from north downwards, from Kebi to Sokoto to Zamfara to Katsina to, to Yobe to, to Bono, down to Adamawa, up to Mubi area on the Cameroonian border. These are vulnerable border entries to Nigeria where there is infusion of terror and tension by jihadists into this country. And this is being met at home with severe human security problems of poverty, lack of jobs, uh, lack of rain in the Sahel from the west to the east part of the country, along that belt of the country, average temperature 35 degrees, no capacity to grow because there's no rainfall, you no food to sell because there is no production taking place. It has provided a fertile ground for the recruitment of young people who will take pitons in exchange for a gun to go and carry out an operation. This is the issue. The partisan argument is lame, is weak, and is jaded. And that's not what we should be discussing at this point in time. It, that's not the issue. The issue is all hands must be on deck. What, what do we gain by partisan scoring of points when we lose Nigeria? The people who want to use security as a means of electioneering and edging out those in power for them to come back there, what do they govern when there's no Nigeria? When there's war in Zamfara, there's problem in Kasina. In Ogun State, there are displacement. In Oyo Ekiti, there is killings going on. In the East, everything is happening. In that kind of context, how do you govern, regardless of what party you belong to? I think we should suspend this issue of focus on 2023 and focus on how to salvage this country so that people who have the intellect, the capacity, the vision, and the knowledge with solutions to solve Nigeria and take it out of this problem. That is what we should interrogate. Those are the questions we should be asking, not scoring points. OK. Well, let, let me ask uh, Honorable Bradley. Um, I, I understand, of course, uh, it's something that uh, mm -hmm. Senator Ali Tumbi um, talked about earlier uh, about the arms purchase and so many people are asking questions about that including the hallowed chambers of the house of representatives uh, everyone would recall the house adult committee on arms and ammunition control uh, inviting the the chief of army staff recently to ask questions about that and of course we've heard uh, from senator Adutumbi the kind of things that perhaps should have been done but then it's over two years now, almost three years since the conversation started about one billion dollars released one way or another for arms and ammunition for the House of Representatives to come up with an ad hoc committee to ask those questions. It will suggest that the standing committees on security, uh, Navy, Air Force, and Army are not doing you know, due diligence and the oversight that they're supposed to be performing. What should be done now, either with the committees or with the military, the, the, the all, all arms of the military, in finding out exactly where we are concerning those arms purchases? Oh, thank you very much. I don't want to say it is an indictment on the various military committees we have in the House. But again, you see, there is no monopoly of wisdom. Um, if the speaker in his wisdom fails, we should have 
different input from different people, apart from the committees that were assigned the oversight function of the military. I think it's nothing bad about it. That as it may, you agree with me that um, honestly, I, 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 I believe there's a lot going on. And uh, it's very sad. And uh, it's, a, it's in the public uh, purview that um, I think these monies were not used judiciously. Um, today, if you go and visit the men that are in the forefront of the war, they will tell you that they are still using the AK-47, which is now old. There is modern AK-49, which I feel, I'm not an expert, but I think it's more modernized than the AK-47. Now, you ask yourself, have they really been supplied these modern gadgets? You see a military man on the road where he knows that any time there will be an attack, he doesn't have any vest, a, bullet, a, a bulletproof vest. How much is a bulletproof vest that somebody will just expose his chest and any time there is a shot, he's gone, especially if it hits his chest. And the bulletproof vest is meant to protect the vital organs of the body. Let's be very honest. How many of them do you see them with bulletproof vest? Bulletproof vest, as common as it looks, they hardly don't, they hardly don't have. Check some of the guns they use. They still use some of these old guns that, has this, that are very long. I know I've been seeing these guns for the past 30 years or 40 years. Mm -hmm. And they are still using those ones. So if the question you want to ask, does it mean our military does not know that there are modern gadgets and equipment now? Or is it deliberate? This is where I, I, I have questions to ask. Because if the House of Representatives set up that at work committee, I think these are the questions we should ask. Of course, we shouldn't expose to the public the modern weapons we have. Because again, that's a security breach. But at least... Members of the House of Reps can be trusted. And they will be told, you know, something will come out and say, oh, uh, these are the latest modern gadgets we have. But we need to know that these modern gadgets were bought. But just look at it. As common as the bulletproof vests, mm. some of our military don't have it. I, I, some I, of I, them I, even go without the helmet. Mm. You know. Now, I, I don't know. The, how, how was the issue resolved eventually? Because that, that day, the pressmen were asked to excuse... Uh, the committee, were they able to make progress eventually? He, he promised, the chief of our minister promised that he will bring the report. I am not aware whether he has brought it now. But that's why he said, after, mm. after being very arrogant about it, mm. that he is not the one that was there. Mm. So, Senator, did somebody... Yes, just permit me to, you know, issue some clarifications. I, I think, uh, largely, again, I'm going to say that government communications can go a long way to change narrative and take us from speculation to facts, so that at least the public know what is going on. Military hardware, he said as simple as a bulletproof vest. vest are. They are not items you just purchase off the shelf. In no, 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 let me finish. These are sensitive technologies that the access to them is controlled by the people who produce them and the countries where they come from. So there's a lot of bilateral diplomacy that is required that gives you access to this kind of Do market. you think so, that it is possible for yes. state actors too? I mean, because there are huge questions yeah. uh, around how it is that the, the bandits, the bad people, are yeah. getting weapons. Mm -hmm. And we have to go through very laborious channels to get weapons to fight them in turn. Mm. Do you think that we should begin to explore some of the channels they explore as well? I don't think that would be decent for a government to do, but the truth of the matter is that the local bandits, terrorists, Boko Haram, whatever they are called, they are Nigerian cells of a global network that have its own supply chain of technology, of hardware, of bullets, and, and resources that comes to them. How do they fund it? Kidnapping, bank robbery, 
taking illegitimate rent. That's how they fund it. That's how they fund but it. The, but, but the but point the is access, that for Nigeria yes. to have access to its own legitimate Weapons. supply, mm. it needs to up its ante by engaging in government-to-government -government negotiation. Indeed. For example, no. do you know that it is impossible for you to just walk into a military aircraft producing country and just pay and receive? The government of that country must give a go-ahead, so which is a product of the relationship between Nigeria and those countries. Senator, I hear you. But yeah. then, you know, there have been questions in times past. Because, you know, what we're also trying to do, I think uh, what Honorable is also trying to say, and he, I'm sure he can speak for himself, yeah. is to marry this mm -hmm. with accountability. Sure. With, there have been times past when our armory has not been as secure um, as we would love to think that it will be. I mean, this is something that is very well documented. That. I agree with so, that. So, indeed, if there are questions as to how is it that we're spending money you know, uh, 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 since we are appropriating so much, are we really getting value for money? Whether or not it is, you know, it is easy to get this equipment. What we have in store, is it really going around to serve the people that, you know, need this equipment as and when they should get it? You see, the, Aren't these valid questions no, no, to valid ask? No, valid question. I, I, I agree with that question. And my comment simply is this. He has said, that there are complaints, allegations of complicity by people in high office, political, economic, and security, that have probably ideological sympathies, maybe religious, maybe ethnic sympathies for the, for the, for the, for the campaign of the terrorists. It is the duty of government. It is the duty of government to find out who these people are make them culpable is a treasonable offense for any military person to be giving information to people who are trying to destroy this country we should fish them out but the point i'm telling you is this sheep has come to show and robber has made the road well senator time in nigeria Senator, if, if you don't mind uh, me butting in for a bit, that issue that you have just raised now, it is the responsibility of government, no doubt, but government has various agencies that are supposed to perform certain functions. For instance, the DSS, you know, released a statement underscoring what so many people have been saying, and there are certain individuals who are trying to form in trouble in the country, some form of disintegration plan. We've heard governors say over and over again that there are certain political elements who are fomenting trouble, uh, you know, supporting this banditry and all of these things that you're talking about. If it is the responsibility of government and all this information is available to government, what then are we waiting for? Are they so powerful, more powerful than the country that these individuals can't be picked up? Well, <clears throat> the beauty of democracy is that there's a function of government, there's also a demand side. Okay? to democracy and performance of government. And that's the point I'm making. The time for the demand side and the supply side, which is government, to, to dialogue, to, to meet. It's not just elections that government needs people for. Government needs people to put it on its toes so that it can do what it's supposed to do. That is the beauty of a democracy. It's a game of checks and balances. Okay? If government ought to do certain things and it's not doing it, then People should, should rise up to the occasion and, and demand it. The media should demand it. But you, Senator, should demand Senator, it. Senator, if the you can speak pointedly, just, oh, just one second, okay. if you can speak pointedly to this thing, to this particular fact, there are, according to the DSS, and some governors, which I'm pretty sure you are aware of, even the presidency has said this, that there are certain political elements, some politicians, who are fueling this insecurity one way or another. In your opinion, what do you think should be done by the authorities to ensure that these individuals are brought to book? Is it so difficult to, for them to be picked up, for them to be arrested the, the, the and, is, and, and, the, the, and kept the, the, at bay? My, my, my solution to that is whoever has information about people that are working towards the disability of Nigeria should be confident enough to name names. The era of diplomacy is over. If you have concrete accusation against anybody, put a name to it. 
Okay? Name and shame. And let the law take its course. And let there be a defense. The accuser and the accused must meet and debate it. And let the public judge who is lying. And if there are serious infractions, let the you know, justice process take its course. Let the law enforcement take its position. And let the courts come to life. In America, when Trump was trying all manners of things to personalize the democracy of America, the courts rose, the people rose, civil society rose, media rose up, the institutions rose, the courts you know, put their foot down. And that's what saved America. It is time for similar institutions, clusters of people and interests in Nigeria to rise to the occasion. Democracy is not served a la carte. It has to be demanded and insisted upon, and people must do what they are supposed to do, make government uncomfortable, demand for results, and name names, and stop these speculations. Well, I know that this uh, conversation is one that is going to continue. Uh, we, it's very difficult to get you, you know, to the studios and it's an it's be, but, you know, um, just before we go, let me quickly take the closing words uh, of Honorable Badi. Yeah, thank you. I think for me, patriotism is what is needed. We have, we have, we, there is moral, uh, uh, decay, corrup moral corruption, there is nationality corruption, there is religious corruption, and there is financial corruption. I will tell you in my sojourn as a politician, I've come to realize that most people, including the civil service, including the military, everybody is after what he will get for himself and his family. This is my take. I am saying it authoritatively because I've had in different fora when politicians will go at what they ask is what they will get. They will ask what is for us, not what is for the country. And as long as everybody wants to continue to milk the country, then one day the cow will die and we will all suffer for it. And this is what is happening today. Why is it that unemployment reaches very high? <clears throat> Most of us politicians, we give it to our cronies. So anybody who has nobody will not get a job. It's not supposed to be like that. It's, it's abnormal. Why is it that every lucrative position, go to, I'm just giving you, go to the lucrative NNPC today. Their employment is not open. They will tell you it's open. But I assured you, not every ordinary Nigerian can get employment in NNPC. Why is it so? So for me, there is need for reorientation. And we must find true Nigeria. Patriots that will love this country. Not love for themselves. Or their religion. Or their region. Or their ethnic tribe. Because why do we advocate all this rotational presidency? It's because the people that are there are not fair. As far as I'm concerned, if the man from the East, who is called Okichuku, is the president of Nigeria and he's doing well, I don't care. Let him remain there as long as he wants. You've been Babangida because you're from the north. Or perhaps as long as the constitution allows him As long as the constitution allows him. This is Babangida and I'm being killed every day. And you come and tell me, oh, he's my brother from the north. Or we are the same religion. I don't care. That is rubbish. But unfortunately, the elite has worked on the brain of the poor. I keep on asking the poor today. I said, if there's a religious crisis, the GRAs are not affected. Why is it that it's the slums that are affected? Yes, because Honorable. the poor man has been deceived that religion is what he should pay allegiance to. But the big men will sit in their jerry. There is no, you don't see any fighting going on. Mm. They are doing the same businesses. Dangote today has Christians and Muslims and everybody within the company. Honorable, this conversation is definitely one that will keep going on. I mean, until we find the solutions, and it's a little bit has said we should find... Um, what did he say now? I'm trying to um, find the right words that he used now. But you have said that we need to find patriots. 
and we need to demand accountability that democracy will not be served a la carte. On this note, I have to say, gentlemen, thank you so much for coming on Sunrise Today this morning. Senator, we're hoping that when we call on you, it will not be so difficult to get you. Yeah, I'm, I'm at your service. <laughs> I promise. Thank you. Again, thank you so much uh, for coming on Sunrise Today this morning. Senator Lubumiade Tumbi is the chairman of the um, Senate Committee on National Planning and Economic Affairs. And Honorable Yakubu Barde is former minority whip of the House of Representatives. Thank <music> you.